Hi everyone, thank you for being here. During this talk, we will be talking about defeating static signatures in black box antivirus engines. But first, uh, let me say a few words about myself. I'm a security researcher working at the company that runs Insomniac, and I have some background on antivirus software because I work on that since uh, 2015. And uh, I also happen to be the author of a project that we open sourced um, two years ago. If you want to know more about the work that we do on antivirus software, I can only recommend to you that you check out our blog. Um, here is the way my talk is organized. I'm going to uh, directly show you a demo of the tool. You know, without uh, making any comments about it, but my hope is that uh, I will raise the interest, uh, keep you interested until the, the rest of the talk. And then I'm going to you know, get some stuff out of the way, like why we do antivirus evasion research at LCRT. And next, I'm going to give you a quick refresh about um, the antivirus detection capabilities, as I know it. And then we will be able to talk about uh, the way we designed our tool. So um, about the, the demo, if the demo gods are with me. Um, it takes a, a bit of time to, to run until the end. So I will first run the demo and then I will uh, continue to, to talk. Uh, I'm a man, so I can do two things at once. So here we have um, a component of a Metropreter. And this is the, the tool that is the subject of this talk. Oh, sh sh I was sure it's, it's what's going to happen, but I have to quit the demo to It's quite it's quite awkward to do that, but I've run the, the tool and it's doing its magic. And while he's doing that, I can uh, continue with the slide. So it will be open sourced on GitHub after the talk. It's a uh, 3000 Python line of codes. And if it's that small, that's uh, because we are standing on the shoulders of giant here. Uh, thanks to frameworks such as Ryzen, Leaf, and Keystone. And the demo I've just uh, started is, is about uh, Metropreter because, um, you know, I, I'm a pen tester and um, we like to use Metropreters uh, since uh, many years, and we won't stop doing that. It works very well, but, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's uh, detected by many antivirus engines. And the signature's name is uh, Metropreter um, something API retrieval, which uh, does not mean uh, uh, something to me. And the goal is to find uh, the things that are detected by Windows Defenders or other antivirus engines. Let me switch to the demo. It's still uh, doing stuff. And you know, at this point, you don't have to understand anything. It will be clear by the end of it. Um, it's actually done. And here, uh, what I can already tell you is that if you patch the following bytes uh, within the Metropreter mine component, you will be able to bypass uh, Windows Defender. And you know, at this point, um, I, I can't uh, look at this binary data and make sense out of it, uh, but uh, it will be clear um, later on. Uh, that being said, I have to give you a few reasons because, uh, you know, doing antivirus evasion research might sound unethical at first, especially for a company like ours because, you know, we are a security company and we uh, make the recommendation that you install antivirus software. And uh, if that were the case, why would we advise, would, would, would we, um, you know, try to bypass antivirus? The, the first reason I will give you 
Um, it's based on a silly analogy, but uh, it helps uh, me get my point across. Um, you know, you have this game where you have, you're given a set of objectives and you have to take them out without uh, making, uh, making the guy complain. And I think it's almost the same when you are doing internal pen test engagements and you don't want to make the antivirus complain. Either because you are doing a red team and you can't afford to be detected, uh, otherwise it's game over. Or during your internal pen test, um, you don't want to trigger the antivirus because uh, it will make you lose time uh, and um, maybe prevent uh, you from exploiting um, vulnerabilities. The second one is the false sense of security. I've often met during uh, several missions. Um, um, you know, the, sometimes your person of contact is not very knowledgeable and it just bought some new fancy antivirus and the time is short. And the only thing standing between you and your domain admin rights are some uh, dumb antivirus and the tools that you are using for years now are detected by, by this tool. Um, you would like to tell your client that it's okay and you will be able to bypass it uh, if you have a few more hours. But at this point, they, they might not believe you and they will challenge your findings. Um, it's one thing to scan for vulnerabilities. It's another to exploit them. And uh, if you are not able to do that because of some uh, security software, they might think that uh, they are secure which is obviously not the case. And a third reason is a funny one. Uh, there was a company that was selling a software and they were the victim of antivirus software because 39 different antivirus were detecting it as, uh, as malware, whereas it was not. For us, it was obviously a false positive, but uh, the company was actually worried that it might contain a virus, either because they were the victim of a supply chain attack or because some uh, malicious employee uh, did put uh, malware in it. And the question uh, for us is, how do you prove to uh, your client that uh, there is no malware in it? And how the client itself prove to their own clients that there is no malware in it? So we have to fix the false positive because Windows Defender and the other antivirus won't do it. That being said, uh, let me uh, give you a quick um, refreshment about the ways antivirus work that will uh, help us uh, make things uh, in context later. So I um, have uh, two distinctions here, before and after executions, because the tests that are realized before and after execution are obviously not the same. The first test that is done uh, does not deserve any mention because it's file hashes. You change a byte and uh, you bypass the, the antivirus. But um, they are aware of that, so they stack their uh, detection uh, mechanism on top of uh, one another in the hope that they are more efficient uh, with their detection. And the second test that is usually uh, realized is a static heuristic detections. Um, it is most uh, commonly known as uh, uh, inter artificial intelligence. And the third one is the subject of this talk. Uh, this is uh, signatures and we will know more about them later. And the last one is emulation. After the, your binary executed, it's not over. You can still be uh, detected and uh, killed. And that happens because the antivirus has uh, several um, subscriptions about uh, several events that, that can happen. Um, and there is plenty of literature on, on the subject. Uh, luckily for us, um, the antivirus have a pipeline of detections, and we can also have a pipeline of uh, anti-antivirus. So for the hashes, you just, just change it a bit. And for defeating the static heuristic detection, uh, we um, published some uh, obfuscator that does that. And to defeat the signatures, this is the subject of this talk. So. Uh, stay with me and to detect the emulator, that's one way to, uh, to defeat it. And as, um, uh, with regards to real time monitoring, you know, you can just patch the different, uh, hooks, uh, um, even if they are in, in kernel and there is no problem to do that and it will make the antivirus blind. 
So um, this is the way uh, my talk is uh, organized for, uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, the, the first thing that we have to, um, to do is to automate scans because, um, yes, you, maybe you run a red team and you have a set of tools that you are using for years uh, now and you don't want to change, but uh, you want to be aware when a set of tools gets detected by some antivirus. And uh, more specific to this talk, um, we want to apply thousands of mutations on a sample until the sample comes out uh, clean. And to do that, we have to automate scans and obviously we, we want to do that manually. And at this point, you might wonder what, our, why are we not doing it with uh, virus total? It's because uh, uh, for first, they share the sample with uh, vendors. And the second one uh, is the API is very, very costly, even for a company. Uh, luckily for us, uh, we have uh, Tavis or Mondi on this earth, and sometimes he decided to uh, to create magical things, like uh, the time when he decided to port Windows Dynamic Link libraries to Linux. And for us, that's a good thing because uh, Windows Defender um, scan engine is mpclient.dll, and it's standalone. And load library, the project from Tavis or Mondi, is able to to run it, so it's perfect for automation. The problem arises with other uh, antivirus engines because uh, sometimes they don't offer a command line interface and sometimes uh, they only run on Windows. To uh, tackle that issue, I've decided to um, use VMware's VM Run. Uh, this is a tool that ships uh, by default with, uh, with VMware. Um, on the right, you can see um, a command that you can run uh, on a virtual machine provided that you have the VMX file. And on the left, you see the mandatory parameters that you have to uh, to provide uh, in order for the command to, to work. Obviously, that's the password and username of uh, the guest operating system. Uh, more precisely, here are two commands that will be useful to us. If, uh, we, if um, we want to uh, automate a scan uh, with VMware, we first have to copy a file from the host to the guest machine, and then we want to invoke the, the antivirus scan engine. And this is a more uh, complete example uh, with Kaspersky antivirus. So here um, we call the VM run command. We provide the username and password, call the run program in Quest, and we provide the path to the VMX file. Uh, where I installed Kaspersky, uh, you know, trial version, it's enough. Um, then uh, VM run expects uh, the full path to the executable to be run. In the case of Kaspersky antivirus, it's avp.exe, which also expects uh, the keyword scan and a file to, to scan. When uh, your antivirus does not offer a command line interface, you can still rely on some oracle to know if the antivirus detected as malware or, or not. And to do that, uh, I have two steps. Um, first, we copy the file from the host to the guest, like uh, usual. And next, we can um, leverage the fact that some antivirus will trigger a scan once the file is written to disk. And uh, when that's the case, uh, we can assume that the file will be de deleted or put into quarantine. If the antivirus does not do that, uh, most likely it will uh, trigger the scan when the file is executed. So to uh, do that, we actually run the sample and later on we check that the file uh, exists on disk. If it does not, um, it was not a malware, it was not detected as malware, and if it's not there anymore, um, it was detected as malware. Now that we can automate scan, we will be talking about a search algorithm in order to find signatures. So this is a, a common problem. We have a needle and we have a huge haystack. How do we find the needle in the haystack? Uh, here in this case, I've chosen as example, uh, Mimikatz. Mimikatz is a one megabyte binary and uh, obviously not those, uh, not the entire file is detected as malware, sorry, only some specific parts in it that are detected and we want to find them. Um, this is a problem that has been with us for some years now, so obviously we have some um, public projects about it. 
Uh, the first I'm aware of is DSplit, which came out in 2006. Um, the idea be behind DSplit is to split a file into smaller parts uh, and to see which small parts triggers the antivirus. And the further check, which came out in 2019, also does that, but uh, in a better way. The problem with this uh, methodology is that uh, when you split uh, executable files into chunks, uh, you assume that the antivirus might treat the chunks the same way as it might treat uh, an entire executable file. That's because of the portable executable structure. Um, if you break it, uh, you know, the antivirus has no way to know that it's an actual executable, so it, it might skip uh, scanning it. And the second reason is the granularity, but uh, more on that later. The solution for us uh, was to um, uh, still do mutations, but um, that are aware of the PA format. If you don't remember about the PA format, uh, here is a quick uh, reminder. Um, it's a file format, so obviously there is a, there are a lot of headers that we don't care about. Um, as a software developer, what we want to know is that your code will most likely be present in a text section. And the data sections contains initialized uh, data that can still be written to. So most likely you will find your global variables here. And in the R data um, section, uh, it's uh, sections uh, where initial data are present, but they cannot be written to. So most likely you will find constants such as strings and the other sections are less interesting. So um, if you were a lazy engineer and you were working uh, for an antivirus company, what would you do to, to solve the problem of a virus like uh, McAfee uh, pretended to do? Um, most likely you will search for, for strings because they carry a lot of intent, you know. Some developers even leave the double symbol path uh, of, of their executable and you, you can know the name of the person that wrote malwares. Uh, so it's a shortcut, why not take it? But if you were to take that shortcut, why would you um, search for sequences of bytes? This is the same view as before, but um, um, laid out differently. Um, if you want to find hashes or inline constant, you would look for them inside the text section. If you want to find shell codes or um, other stuff, maybe you, um, take your chances with the data section. If you want to look for strings, um, that will be the R data section. At this point, you might wonder, yeah, sure, if I was a lazy engineer, I would do that, but engineers, actual engineers working in antivirus company, they won't do that, right? And I'm not saying they do that. Uh, I can only show you something and uh, you will make your own uh, deduction. So here we have some files I have selected for the demo. Um, here we have um, a component of Metapreter, and that's an option to trigger an antivirus scan. And here Metapreter detected uh, as malware. Now let's say I want to check my assumptions, and let's say I want to hide uh, one section, which is the data section. This allows me to, to patch the file. And now if I scan it again, shit. It's not detected anymore. And it doesn't make sense because the data sections only contain initialized uh, data. Uh, I would assume by uh, the year 2022 that uh, a billion dollar companies would uh, actually uh, you know, run semantical analysis on files and that's not the case. Um, I, I forgot that, that slide. Uh, I've shown you metserver.x64.dll. Uh, 
And where does it come from? If you uh, install Metaspot framework, there is a sub repo called Metaspot payloads, and you can uh, fetch the latest versions this way. And once you impact the Ruby gem, you will find the, the following files that are scanned. Sorry. So we are lazy engineers, um, always everywhere. Um, so they target um, sequences of bytes of arbitrary length. And I also know by experience that uh, strings or uh, sequences of bytes have malicious or uh, benign scores. And I don't care about uh, benign scores and I don't care about low malicious score. I want to find the fewest amount of strings that have the highest score. Why? Because let's say I have my results and I know which string are detected by Windows Defender or some other antivirus. I will need to patch them and it's easier to patch three strings than, than uh, a thousand of strings. So um, I decided to uh, rely on the uh, divide and conquer algorithm. If you don't remember how it works, uh, you have your A stack and it's too big to, to find your needle. So what you will gonna do, you will cut the A stack into halves um, give one half to a colleague and uh, you will uh, concentrate your effort on your own a half and it's still too big so cut it in half and, and so on until you have um, a half, a half uh, small enough that you may just know if your needle is present in it. Of course there are other ways to, to find stuff. I've also tried a linear search but uh, it was not uh, um, very, very efficient for me. And uh, more precisely, uh, applied to executables and antivirus software, you want to split the sample, fill one half with uh, random junk, and redo an antivirus scan. And then two, thing, two things can happen. Either the file is detected as malware, either it's not. If the file is detected as malware, it means that the half you filled with, uh, with random junk was not relevant for the uh, antivirus. But the file that was left intact uh, suffice to trigger the antivirus detections, so you will concentrate your efforts on that. And you repeat that process by um, splitting the half that was left intact and uh, one half with junk data, one half left intact, and you repeat that process. But we can do better than uh, splitting and scanning things. Um, we have seen before the PA format section, uh, sections, and there are different stuff in different sections. If um, the antivirus triggers on the text section, you know that in it you will find functions, so the, the granularity in there will be functions that you can recover with your favorite data assembler. If the data section is detected, most likely it will be a global variable, so um, I had no tools to do that, so build my own. And to um, react uh, to a detection inside the air data section, uh, we know there is strings in here, and uh, it's a chance for us because Radar 2 works uh, very well with strings and we can enumerate them and uh, have a granularity on strings. And uh, talking about strings, uh, here is a practical example um, with some imicats. Mimikatz contains 5,000 strings, so it's way too much to do the analysis manually. And the strings have between 5 and 100 characters, uh, so we have a good granularity. And applied to that, a divide and conquer algorithm would mean that we split the 5K strings into two clusters. Um, for the cluster one, we replace the content of every string in, uh, in this cluster with uh, random data and we want to keep it the same size because otherwise we would corrupt stuff and here we are precise. And the strings in cluster two uh, are left intact. We patch the sample with this modification and then we do an antivirus scan and then two things can happen as you understood well and um, our reaction to that will depend on the fact if the malware is still detected or not. We repeat the process until we have two clusters that only contain one string in each. Um, so that uh, once we do the antivirus scan, we know which string was detected and uh, recursively we can uh, enumerate all the strings that are detected. So I can do a quick demo, but um, I would prefer to 
um, to show you something I've already run because I don't know if I'm not short on time, but it takes three minutes to, to run uh, completely. So here is uh, Mimikatz soon. The output is very verbose, don't worry. So we have our tool and we have Mimikatz. We just run the tool on Mimikatz and it will by itself uh, figure out uh, what are the things that are detected by, uh, by Defender in this case. And to begin the analysis, the, the tool first patch every string. Let me jump to the end. And at some point, um, he did the divide and conquer algorithm and he found that string first. That was the, the highest score string. And you, you may recognize it if you already used Mimikatz. It's the, the famous header, you know, um, à la vie à l'amour. Um, and to me, I don't know about you, but uh, it's very stupid to me that an antivirus would look for that. But yeah, anyways. And the st other strings that are detected are the following. Uh, these are a function name, uh, like real function name that are offered by Microsoft for you to use. Um, they are telling me that the text was too small. So um, we found strings that once you patch them, uh, the file is no longer detected as Mimikatz. But uh, at this point, you might wonder, um, is that really true? Um, Where's there really the strings that are looked for by Defender? And I don't want you to take my word for it. And to prove that it's correct, we uh, um, there is only two ways to do that. It's to work at Microsoft and uh, have a Windows Defender source code. And unfortunately, that's not the case for us. So we have to rely on uh, reverse engineering. And uh, um, a guy named uh, Komial uh, already did the work. And a very esteemed colleague of mine, Romain Melchior, uh, built upon that and uh, fully automated the process. And what you are seeing here is the, the result um, spit out by, by his tool. On the top, you see the signature name. And in the middle, you see the raw binary data that are looked for by Windows Defender. And on the bottom, you see the strings that were extracted from this uh, raw binary data. And you see the same strings that uh, our, our tool found, like the URL to the blog of uh, John Tikui and uh, the function names. Now, let's say that um, uh, there is a signature in the data section. We know that there is most likely global variables in there. And it's hard for the human eye to recognize, recognize uh, raw binary data. So what I did was uh, trying to recover them um, by uh, leveraging the fact that if you have a global variable, most likely you use, uh, use it somewhere in your program. So you expect to find a cross-reference coming from the text section going into the data section. And that allows me to find the address of the global variables, uh, which is not enough. You also need to know their length. And to do that, I made the assumption that the length is equal or less to uh, the address of the ne next cross-reference. And then you do the divide and conquer algorithm on that. And you will be able to find the signatures um, that are detected by Windows Defender inside the data section. So let me get back to a demo. This time I will make the text bigger. Should be enough. Or not. This time it's, it's good. So that's the output I've shown you before beginning the talk. And that was a component of Metapreter. And the tool identified that the following sequences of bytes 
is responsible for Windows Defender detection. And if, we, if you patch these bytes, it's no longer detected. So what the heck are those bytes? And to answer that, I'm just going to, to grep like a Windows Defender does. Uh, these are the first uh, two bytes that you are seeing here. And it spit out only one file. Good. And here you're starting to see interesting stuff, strings. But those strings are special in the sense that they are shell codes. I'm not here. Here, that's the shellcode that is detected by Windows Defender. And yeah, it might make sense because this shellcode allows to uh, transfer your interpreter session into another process. So you would uh, infect another process with your interpreter session. But still, um, there are a lot of interesting stuff in the file that we've just seen and Defender only is able to detect the strings in it. And uh, here I've decided to show you some code, but uh, don't worry, the goal is not to explain uh, each line. I just wanted to show you how easy it is to, once you rely on powerful frameworks such as Radar2, you are able to um, you know, do stuff like uh, global variable recovery. And the most interesting stuff is on the right. Um, pipe.cmdj allows to run a radar2 command and get back the result as JSON. And the subcommand axg allows to enumerate cross-reference and get back the result as JSON. And um, what goes on, on on this function is exactly as I've told you before. But uh, you, you might wonder, um, uh, is that really necessary? And I've uh, just shown you that, uh, yes, uh, it's necessary to do that because um, some antivirus are stupid and will look for uh, global variables. Um, when all else fails and there is a section where raw binary data is looked for, you have to rely on chunks and we know that's an issue because chunks may overlap, envelope or intersect. And here I've um, chosen a special case uh, which uh, really happened uh, and, um, by experiments. Uh, let's say you have uh, an interval for a signature. You know it's somewhere in the middle of the file, uh, but once you start splitting things, you will break the actual signatures and you, the analysis won't be able to continue. Uh, to solve that issue, I relied on the interval trees because uh, they are uh, exactly uh, made for that. Uh, you have you have to maintain a list of intervals. Uh, once you have found a given interval, uh, doesn't matter if it's the interval is very big, you remember it. And as the analysis goes on, you have smaller and smaller intervals. And uh, once the analysis is finished, you um, can do queries on the tree of intervals, like uh, which interval envelops uh, which other interval. This allows to fit filter results. And as a bonus, uh, let's say that we have identified uh, the strings that are uh, looked for by uh, antivirus engines. And you, you are lazy um, and you don't want to go into source code, patch the source code and rebuild the software. You want to automatically patch the binary. But um, obviously, you don't want to break the binary. And if you just simply remove the strings, the, the binary might not work anymore. So is it that possible? Is that possible to encrypt strings uh, directly inside binaries? I didn't know at the time, but I took on the challenge. And this is the, the idea I came up with. Uh, first thing first, you need a decryption function that you want to inject inside the binary, because the binary uh, was never meant to decrypt stuff, maybe. And then you encrypt uh, every string. And for each string, 
you want to make sure that once the binary actually executes and uh, might uh, need the, the strings in clear text, uh, you want to make sure that the strings actually is in clear text so you decrypt it before and. Um, to do that, you enumerate the cross-reference to each string. And for the first cross-reference, you hijack execution flow by uh, patching uh, some bytes. You redire redirect this execution flow within a switch table. And uh, you, know, you take care of the register. Uh, you save the original instruction pointer. Um, and you set the correct registers to call the decryption functions. And once that's done, you can uh, go back to, to normal. And here are some code again. I just wanted to show you how easy it is to uh, hook stuff with radar2. Um, once you know a cross-reference to a given string, you can uh, use radar2 to um, recover the assembly instructions that uh, actually use the strings. And you have to overwrite those bytes with something that is small enough um, uh, that is able to hijack exec execution flow, but not um, too big because it would mess up uh, the assembly code. Then you uh, compute the offset to the switch table, which will depend for each string. And then we assemble code with uh, Keystone and we inject the entire result with uh, radar2 and the wx command. The hook content is as follows. Uh, uh, you have to save the registers, obviously, and uh, you want to call the decryption function. And then you want to do the, um, you know, we, we overwrote some assembly uh, instructions, so we have to um, put them here. And then we can resume execution flow. Next, uh, we said that we need a decryption function. And I'm also a lazy person, so I didn't want to write my decryption functions in assembly, so I wrote it in C. And I built the binary with uh, pi so that uh, the, the function is fully positioned and independent. And then we can strip out the functions with the, with leaf. Leaf is a framework that is able to manipulate the executable file. And here I just wanted to show you again um, how easy it is to, to do that. Um, because leaf offers a functions called get content from virtual address, which expects an address and a size and uh, both of which can be recovered with the uh, radar2 and the aflj command, which allows to enumerate functions and there are uh, and there, um, you know, some things about the functions. And once you have the code of the decryption function, you have to actually inject it inside the binary. And in three lines of, line of code, you can create a section and put some code in it. And you know, that's done. Um, obviously, there is there are some limitations about the, the tools that we did. It's not for script kiddies in the sense that every time you use it, you will most likely need to patch something in it. Um, and that's no issue for me because I use it uh, what's, uh, you know, some time to time, only when my binaries are detected. And for me, it's more of a library of features than uh, a tool that just does magic and that we don't understand. And there are some uh, things we might want to optimize, uh, like uh, the text sections. I did not bother to uh, um, exploit the function boundaries, so uh, I just searched for chunks because I did not meet an antivirus that was uh, um, trouble enough uh, for, for this task. And we could um, anal also analyze strings present in source code only because when you are building a, a, a binary, you will f uh, find there are several thousands of strings that are not uh, really used by your program, but uh, they are in the binary because of the dependencies. And I highly doubt that uh, Windows Defender will trigger on those strings. So you could save time and uh, enumerate the strings that you have inside the source code of Mimikatz, for in, uh, instance, and only run the analysis on that. You could also um, provide a make file for a project that you want to, to build and only build uh, a subset of this program. And at first, it won't be detected by, by the antivirus, but uh, as long um, uh, when you add code, 
uh, there is a point where the actual signatures will be inserted, and at this time it will be detected by the antivirus. And that will be your telltale sign that you, you have found uh, your signature. And to conclude, this is a tweet that I saw uh, from uh, Tavis Formandi. Uh, to uh, give you some context, MP Engine is the Windows Defender scan engine. Um, and I found it quite amusing that uh, he has to fix bugs that we report, and he has no idea what we are, why we are using his tool. So that's it. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, is there any question? Yes. Did you check the tools by Quark's lab called IRMA that do basically uh, same as offline scanning for antivirus? Uh, yes, I did. I also I even tried to use it. Uh, as I understand, uh, the free versions only come so with support for uh, um, Linux, Linux versions of antivirus. And um, yeah, it was not uh, suitable for my use case. I, I was looking for something much uh, simpler. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm positive that it will uh, work as well. The free version is, you can use uh, Windows antivirus as well, but you need some licenses, for example, for Kaspersky or, or antivirus like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it will uh, work very well, but uh, load the libraries, uh, you know, it, it works very, very well and it's installed in uh, two minutes. So um, you can do uh, however you want and that's just the way I chose to go about it. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering uh, if this ever happens on the um, divine and conquer algorithm specifically. Um, does it ever happen that none of the chunks are detected, but not necessarily because the detection is split into two, but maybe because the antivirus was using something in the in the chunk that was that does not contain the signature to maybe validate the file? So maybe maybe like for an example, maybe it sees that. Uh, some chunk has been replaced with random data and maybe marks the file as damaged and then no longer gives a detection because of that. Does that ever happen? Or, and if so, are there like any ways to address that? Uh, I don't know if I explained that properly. Let yeah, I see what you mean. And the only times it happened to me uh, was not, um, it was when I was overwriting uh, specific stuff. And if you're very precise in your analysis and you overwrite, for instance, the strings and you respect the, the size, you, you won't break anything. But uh, yeah, I see what you mean. And it's very important to, to not break stuff and uh, be critical about the results you get back from uh, the tool that we propose. That uh, makes sense. If a signature is, uh, is detected as signatures, of course, you have to check manually uh, inside source code and see if it makes sense. Because sense. maybe, Thank like you. you say, you have broken uh, the, the file and the antivirus was emulating it. And since the file no longer can be emulated, the antivirus uh, no longer decided to uh, scan it until the end. Thank you very much. Other questions? If no, we can. Thanks, Vladimir, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.